Here's a famous photo of Nick Diaz as a child. It's a class photo. All the other kids are all neat and tidy, looking mild-mannered and well-behaved. So it wouldn't take a psychologist to pick the fighter out of this bunch. Here's Diego Sanchez looking mean and ready to go. You got Khabib wrestling bears, Nate Marquardt sleeping in his boxing gloves just in case he has to whoop anyone's ass in his dreams. It's as if their future identities could be seen peeking through, hinting towards a vocation in the grueling world of combat sports. I mean, you look at this photo with Nick Diaz and you think, boy, oh boy, the writing was certainly on a wall with this one. If you were to hazard a guess at how Sean O'Malley's current image may have manifested itself in his youth, I'd say he got his black belt in bedazzling. And he certainly wasn't cut from the same cloth as in Nick Diaz. Sean's earliest memories of MMA were actually of an innate disgust. The first time I saw UFC, I was 13, 14 years old. My dad was watching that, and it was the most disgusting thing. I couldn't watch it. His father, Dan O'Malley, tells his story how on one occasion, he and his other two sons were secretly watching MMA. Hush, hush, because Sean's mother didn't approve of the sport. My younger son, Daniel, my older son, Michael, Sean being the middle son, we snuck downstairs and we were watching CDs of MMA fights, UFC fights, some badass fights back in the day because we had to hide downstairs because the mom said you're not going to show your kids this stuff. That sounds like a good time until Sean came along. He was so disgusted that he ratted them all out to his mother. Sean's probably 12, sneaks down there, sees this. He's like, how can you guys watch this, man? This stuff's disgusting. Runs upstairs, dimes me out, tells his mom, dad's down there watching UFC. Mom comes down and makes it shut it off. Lil Goody Two-Shoes, snitching on his siblings. But that was his natural reaction to the sport, disgust. Honestly, like, disgusted by it. In his own life, he avoided fights as a kid. Didn't view violence as a viable means of conflict resolution for a boy his size. I didn't like confrontation, I didn't like street fights, I avoided it. I wasn't super con confrontational, I didn't want to be in fights, because I felt like I'd get my ass whooped. Mm. So how did a kid with a visceral negative response to MMA and who shied away from confrontation in his life, ever even end up fighting in a cage. Well, that wasn't so much a calling to combat sports specifically, as it was a rudderless teenager's search to find anything that would give him a sense of identity and build his confidence, because Sean was a bit of a misfit. Like, I hated school from day one. From kindergarten, okay. bro? From kindergarten. His, his coloring, dude. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah I, didn't, I didn't like school in general. At all. I hated school. On the other hand, Sean loved sports. He played just about everything. I played basketball, football, soccer, baseball. So I like soccer, on, but then I turned like eight, and I was like, yeah. 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 He couldn't yeah. hang, bro. That's what it was. That's what it was. The cardio wasn't nah. there. He couldn't run. I just became a really good athlete doing all those different sports. All year round, we were playing sports. The issues on the sports field were twofold. Firstly, he just didn't have the physicality, and so he felt overlooked and underappreciated. So, I was so small, I wasn't getting the attention I wanted. I always felt like the coaches didn't, I'm like, put me in, I can make plays. And that's what kind of drove me away from team sports. I feel like they had favorites, and if you weren't the favorite, you weren't gonna play as much, and it drove me crazy. He also wasn't performing in school at a level where he could even make the teams. Well, I did not want to go to school. You had to go to school, you had to get good grades to play these sports. One of the hosts of the Flagrant podcast pointed out that no, you don't really need good grades. I, you had to get good grades to play basketball and football. And what? I, good grades is Hannah? Good grades no, in high school and passing, high school. Dude. Yeah. It's oh, oh, passing. Oh, yeah, yeah, no yeah, pass, yeah. no play. <laughs> you had to not fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as a teenager, Sean probably couldn't tell a quadratic equation from a recipe for spaghetti. The math teacher says, find X, and Sean probably thinks he's on a treasure hunt. So the one thing Sean loved to do, play sports, became a source of frustration, a reminder of both his own physical and academic limitations, and a source of conflict with authority. I'd want to play the entire basketball game. I would hate getting taken out <laughs> in a game. Um, I'd pout. I had a you know, pretty bad attitude. Um, so I, st I, I, got, I got turned away from that kind of, uh, those sports. I mean, Sean had grand designs for his life. Like when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, like I knew I was gonna make it. I had this feeling that I was gonna make make it, whatever making it it is, having money. I wanted to be famous and I wanted to be rich and I wanted to get chick. That was my main motivation mm. growing up. I wanted to be a performer. Like dude, when I was in middle school, I was like, I wanna be in the NFL or NBA. But failing to find a positive avenue for his energy led to a lack of confidence. So very insecure in high school. I, wanted, I was insecure. Very insecure in high school. Now lack of confidence, insecurity, Low self-esteem, all of these are debilitating mindsets that drastically limit people's lives. And this all took place against a pretty bleak backdrop. 
that threatened to gobble up directionless kids like Sean. Both sides of the war on drugs are represented in the O'Malley family. I grew up, my dad was a detective. I'm a retired cop, detective, but... But he wasn't just a throwaway the key kind of cop. He sometimes took his work home with him. Montana Sports tells a story of one such case. A young woman named Mariah Klein, who Dan O'Malley initially locked up for drugs offenses. Mariah credits Dan for literally saving her life by kicking down a hotel door while she was ODing. But later, feeling Mariah was legitimately trying to leave that life behind, Dan helped her through addiction treatment, which enabled her to turn things around and ultimately regain custody of her young daughter. Both Mariah and her daughter became close friends with the O'Malley family, and to this day, the two spent time in Sean's family home. So it appears Dan really cared about the problem and the real lives ravaged by addiction and was prepared to go the extra mile to support people trying to rebuild shattered lives, which must have made it especially difficult when Sean's older brother got sucked into a life of drug-fueled misery. Um, and then my older brother battled addiction for like 10 plus years. Alcohol, meth, dark, dark places, been to jail a bunch. Yeah, yeah I was to jail a lot, <laughs> probably every county. In you know, based on what we know about Sean's history of snitching on his siblings, it was probably Sean tipped off the feds, told them where his brother liked to keep his stash of crack pipes. You can imagine Sean was probably wearing a wire around the house. Rock bottom, and then he dug a little bit deeper a few times. It was embarrassing, you know, when I would come to, I was like, bro, I just spent like eight hours in the shower, just like thinking bugs were coming out of me. <laughs> and hearing stories from my dad, like you got hit, hit over the head with a pistol. I thought Sean was an Illuminati. I was like, I gotta save Sean and- Sean O'Malley and the Illuminati. I don't think he'd quite be discreet enough for their secret soirees. I wanted, I detached from that because I didn't want to deal with the phone call where he's like, hey, Michael's dead. So for Sean, his initial motivators to pursue combat sports were mostly about teenage validation. Well, originally got into fighting because I wanted chicks. Well, I wanted to impress the chicks. I think fighting, that'll do it. But for his father, he was worried Sean might go down the wrong path. And so he asked a local boxing coach to take a look at Sean. I would say two weeks later, he looked at me and he said, uh, you have no idea what you got here. I've never seen anybody with the speed and strength of Sean. Multiple early coaches agreed Sean had serious natural ability. I started kickboxing. I wasn't really taught how to throw a one-two, and I just kind of do these things naturally. And I remember my coaches were like, oh, wow, like, let's, let's book you a fight. Kickboxing fight, 16, knock someone out, get a couple kickboxing fights, knock some more people out. And I was like, okay, this is, you know, this is fun. I kind of start to build that, that confidence that I was looking for. Uh, very so he was knocking guys out right off the bat. He finally had some direction, and some of those initial motivators were satisfied. He was finally getting some chicks. Did it impress the chicks? I think so. <laughs> I don't know if it really, uh, I think just my confidence that I gained from it was, was I was able to, you know, talk to chicks easier. I don't know if it was necessarily like, hey, watch this fight. I think it was just the confidence that came with it. Sure. I mean, that right there was a worthwhile lesson on its own. The sustained effort and deferred gratification required to build skills, which in turn gives your self-esteem something to hang its hat on. You know, the term happiness is kind of vague, but if that is the goal in life, self-esteem will draw you a map. You know, if you commit to things that raise your self-esteem, you will end up happier than you started. And for Sean, the decision to get involved with combat sports was one that transformed him from a skinny misfit who lacked confidence or direction into a confident fighter. I was beating just pretty much everyone up. I was kind of the man at the gym eventually. Fighting. I'm knocking these dudes out. That guy's that just absolutely suck. But I have this confidence. I build this confidence, which is really important for young fighters, mm -hmm. I believe, is to gain that confidence. That's great. But unfortunately, to take it to the next level, you know, to take it beyond getting chicks, to become truly elite and make a career out of it, Sean would have to go through the fire. And that involved the complete destruction of all that newfound confidence. Complete ego just shattered. Every time I left practice, I was crying. Sean had been making a name for himself on the local circuit. At 18, he fought in front of Montana mixed martial artist Tim Welch, a figure who had already made a significant impact on the young O'Malley. Morning, guys. My name is Tim Welch. Yeah, Tim's from Great Falls, Montana. He fought on Bellator Fightmaster. It was like yep. this TV show. I remember that was like inspiring. I was like, whole. I, if I saw you on TV, I was like, they're famous. Like. He made it. Fuck, that guy's from Montana. Like, yeah, I could do it. I want Tim was aware of Sean's reputation as a prospect 
and was impressed enough to offer Sean a life-changing invitation. I had a fight, I was 18. I, I beat this kid, Tim said, hey, if you wanna come and train at a real gym in, in Arizona, let me know. Sean accepted Tim's invitation. He went out to Arizona for a week and got his ass thoroughly whooped. The grapplers were making balloon animals out of Sean. It sounds like even the janitor was using Sean's afro to mop the sweat off the mats after practice. Every single practice, I would leave crying. I've never wrestled in my life until I moved there. But when it came to like grappling days, I had zero chance. So after every practice, I would, it hurt. I was like, fuck, dude, I, maybe this ain't for me. So for a kid who had finally found a foundation on which to build a positive self-image, this was crushing. And it represented a huge test of his dedication to the sport and of his resilience as a young man. I mean, he had enough natural ability to rise above the amateur guys in Montana, but was he tough enough to stick with it, while getting mashed up by high-level fighters who train like professionals? And then I was just the worst dude at the gym. But what the fuck else am I going to do? I wasn't going to go to college. I knew that like third grade. Yeah, I knew I wasn't going to do anything else. I was like, okay, I can learn what these guys are doing, why I'm losing, and I'm a better athlete. So quitting wasn't an option. Instead, Sean went all in. But, but yeah, so I went back to Montana, probably less than a year, worked full time, saved up $2,000, and, and packed my car and drove to Phoenix. What were you doing? He shared an apartment with Tim Welch, who eventually became his full time coach and a critical figure in Sean's life. I mean, Sean gives Tim all the credit in the world. Yeah, there's few people in this world that can change your life, and, and you wouldn't be in certain places without meeting them. Yeah, he gave me that opportunity to come to train in Phoenix, and, and it completely changed my life. That gave me a direction. I'm gonna move to Phoenix. Tim's trying to get into the UFC, so you know I'm gonna surround myself with those people. Well, if I never met Tim, I'd like to think I could have still potentially made it some way, somehow, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. In his mission to catch up with the high-level fighters in Arizona, this kid who had been lazy in school and had a bad attitude with respect to sports, was suddenly the hardest worker in the room. I knew as long as I was athletic, I could learn. I was like, if I go, yeah. just keep going, keep going, keep going, I started getting better because I took it more serious. Like yeah. there was guys that would like, they would work, then go to the gym once a day. I was going twice a day and my main focus was becoming the best I could. So then, you know, after a couple of years, I started catching up. The transformation in Sean's work ethic really shows the importance of having meaningful goals in your life. I mean, just a couple years after being completely lost, Sean was ready for a shot at the big show. A walkaway knockout stole the show in a contender series. He went viral with Snoop and picked up a UFC contract in the process. Dana White's new favorite fighter. It couldn't have gone much better. Sean then won his first two bouts in the UFC by decision, but damaged his foot in the process. Injuries and a string of USADA violations would keep him out of the sport for two years. USADA later linked his positive tests and a number of other fighters' positive tests for the same substance to tainted supplements. One reporter caught up with Sean on his way to a Jimi Hendrix convention. Like when you first get told that news, you're like, it hits you in the heart. You're like, what? I'm gonna get in trouble for something I didn't do? Like literally getting suspended for something I didn't take. On his sidelines, O'Malley kept himself busy, capitalizing on his viral contender series appearance and cultivating an audience on various social media platforms. An audience that probably skews younger than anyone in the UFC. The demographics of Sean's fan base make him an extremely attractive proposition from the UFC's perspective. We're always trying to capture younger viewers. I mean, they need a plan B in case Dana's appearances with the Nelk Boys somehow don't connect with teenagers. <laughs> Sean also had an evolving image, tattoos, eventually tattoos on a face, his hair. And if the fans love it, dude. Every time I fight, people are like, what other hair? Yeah, what, it is what's like your signature thing now. People, yeah, no, what's the hair's, the hair's, people love the hair. Honestly, I thought his nickname was Sugar because he stole his whole image from a stick of cotton candy. You stick a head on this with face tattoos, I mean, that could be Sean O'Malley's brother. So forget about boxing. The sweet science is what Sean calls all them chemicals his wife massages into his scalp to make him look like a sweet sugary treat. Today went really well. Yeah. It only took us six hours. <laughs> but when Sean returned, he put together a string of knockouts before he ran into Cheeto Vera, who apparently kicked Sean's perineal nerve and promptly beat him down. A loss Sean has never accepted. I fought Cheeto Vera. He, he kicked me 
right here, there's a nerve, a perennial nerve that will shut your foot off. I was still piecing his ass up. Like I was out striking him with one foot, went to step back on my foot, but my foot didn't work. I fell down, fight's over. The Sugar State Athletic Commission called it a, a, a no contest. A freak accident happened. It was a fluke. This shit was fucking a fluke. You guys call it what you want. This is a big one. A lot of people have a problem with that. I mean, his leg didn't injure itself. People felt there was an element of delusion here and a lack of respect. His attitude to this loss remains one of the most enduring criticisms of O'Malley. But since then, it was back to business, dropping his opponents like flies. So there was a promising storm developing with O'Malley. Exciting style, distinctive image, viral moment in the Contender Series, and a competent user of social media for self-promotion, where critically, he was connecting with a younger audience. He potentially represented an important figure for the UFC's future, who promoted Sean accordingly. And Dana wanted to protect his asset. When it came time for Sean to take a serious step up in competition against Pyotr Yan, Dana seemed concerned about the potential negative impact on O'Malley's marketability if Yam were to punch all seven colors of the rainbow off his skull. Sean Shelby actually came up with that fight. I said, are you out of your mind? That you don't make that fight now, this and that. He told me why you make it. O'Malley's about to be 28 years old in October, in his absolute prime right now, hits like a truck. He ended up, he ended up selling me on it. Well, technically, Sean got the win here, but not convincingly. Most viewers gave the fight to Yan. Many fans already felt Sean was getting preferential treatment. So for him to get what they felt was a gift from the judges, compounded that sentiment. It also didn't help that it came against Yan, who people felt the judges had just screwed out of the Bantamweight belt. The whole thing left a bad taste. That fight is very exciting. I do love watching that fight back. Very, very close fight. First round was the controversial one. Second one, you can give it to Peter. Third round, you can give it to me. First round was very up in the air. You know, people are like, well, I thought he lost. I thought he lost. I thought he won. I'm like, I don't care at all what anyone thinks about that fight. You know, the judges gave me the fight. That's that, on to the next. Now, that's not an unreasonable argument, but the fact remained an overwhelming majority of fans and media members gave this fight to Yan. So when that win catapulted Sean into a title shot, there were a lot of doubts and reservations. You know, with multiple injuries and the Cheeto fight, there was a perception that Sean's not built for war. The guy's made out of glass and just waiting to get smashed. People felt he wasn't deserving, which, I mean, forget about top 10 wins. At the time of being awarded a title shot, Sean had exactly one win over fighters still in the UFC and most people felt that one win was actually a loss. So many, including the champion, felt he was a product of the UFC's hype machine. Dude, I can't wait to go out there and just smash the, the teacher's pet hype machine and... And Sean kinda had the image of a carefree, disorganized pothead, trying to balance too many things that were all about to come crashing down against one of the more impressive Bantamweights ever. Sean felt that this was a misconception to his advantage. So, yeah, it kind of does look like I just kind of smoke weed and don't do you know too much stuff, but I'm doing everything right. But that's part of the art of war. Aljo and Henry, mm. I'm fighting the winner for the belt. 100%. And I feel like mm. they're both overlooking me. And it's funny, I'll train two months in a row and then go out one night and like people are like, you need to fucking start training. What are you doing partying? If you just look at my Instagram, it doesn't look like I fucking train that much. Mm. But I'm, I mean, I'm in the gym all the time getting better. He maintained that his confidence wasn't the cocky hubris of a young man in desperate need of a humbling. It was based on preparation and real world results. And it's a good confidence feeling, but it, it, yeah, like I said, it comes from those training camps, those eight weeks of complete mental discipline. You know, I don't party at all, don't drink at all. It's train, sleep, recover. That's where you get that confidence from. And while yes, his profile may have allowed him to jump the queue, Sean and his team had always maintained that those are the exact scenarios in which Sean thrives. That when the lights shine brightest, so does Sean. The more fucking people watching, the better I'm performing. And that turned out to be exactly right. Sean's pre-fight analysis of Aljo was prophetic. Aljo, I know how good Aljo is. He's very, very good. There's a reason he's, he's been the champ as long as he's been. Yeah, it's, it's very funky, but it's effective. It's, I'm not, I don't think Aljamain sucks at strength. Uh, you know, it's effective. It's, it's odd. It's awkward. It's, that awkwardness. I, w I would say will, will benefit him until it doesn't, until he leaves too many openings. I find people's chins, and uh, Aljo's cutting a lot of weight. I know people that cut a lot of weight, they lose that, that liquid in their brain, 
and uh, you know, I will find his chin. After a lackluster but tactical first round, a frustrated Sterling threw caution to the wind, lunging forward with a very funky right hand. Sean slides out of range, then comes a beautifully timed counter, and down goes a champion. Couple follow-up shots closes one show and announces the beginning of the next one, The Sugar Show. Yeah, I definitely just exceeded my expectations. Like, to go out there and actually do it. To be honest, if I wasn't me and I was looking at me versus Aljo, I probably would have put money on Aljo too. Like, he beat Peter Yan twice, once. He beat TJ Dillashaw. He beat Henry Cejudo. Dude's on a nine fight win streak. Dominating the bantamweight division, the best bantamweight of all time. Defended the belt three times. And then I'm coming up. My best win was against Peter Yan in a very, very close fight. You know, I would have probably bet against me too. If Not I only had he proved any lingering doubters wrong but he made it look easy and did it in tremendous style. We broke the all-time gate record here. This is also the biggest Bantamweight championship fight ever on pay-per-view. O'Malley isn't gonna be a star. He is a star. You know, is O'Malley a superstar? We'll have to wait and see. But one thing is for sure, Sean might have been pushed by the UFC, but when it came time, he more than held up his end, delivering a perfect performance to capitalize on and accelerate that hype. So we'll see where he goes in terms of becoming a star. But in the cage, he certainly did everything in his power to make that happen. Yeah, it definitely wasn't an overnight, like, this has been 12 years. I started kickboxing when I was 16 years old, moved to Phoenix when I was 18, and it's been two-a-days. Like, I've, I've dedicated my life to this sport. I know you guys see the hair, beautiful pink Lamborghini, you know, the houses and all the fun stuff. But I'm, I'm working. I'm grinding. I'm in the gym. You know, I'm losing. I'm getting beat every single day so I can come out here and win. So the same resilience that saw Sean stick through those challenging early days in Arizona in combination with his new sense of responsibility as a family man. Having a great day coming home to Elena, having a bad day coming home to Elena, like it, it makes this sport, which is very, very difficult, it makes it a lot better. Has carried him all the way to the top of this sport. And there's a lot of things you can take away from Sean's rise. There's an obvious lesson here for the uninspired. The lazy kid with a bad attitude who couldn't apply himself became the hardest and most focused worker in the room once he was in the right room. And sometimes that's all it boils down to for these types of kids. Settling into this newfound path brought Sean to another realization, that while getting chicks and attention were great initial motivators, they became somewhat of a distraction. And the real benefits were in his personal growth, leveling up as a fighter. You know, the building of his confidence, then the building of a career, and now of a legacy. What motivated me was money, chicks like that was what motivated me now we're there and i'm like fuck i have that but that shit's a distraction mm -hmm. it's a dangerous game to play as a final note the positive effects of those ideas have not only transformed sean's life but have extended in very meaningful ways to those around him sean took his shot and moved out to phoenix to pursue his dream and in succeeding years later he was able to move his whole family out. We have such a good relationship. I moved all of them down to Phoenix. They all live very close to me. I got my, my sister. <laughs> my sister was Shayla. Uh, you're 19. Uh, did you like high school? I loved I, high school. You did. See, I always you always seemed like you were having fun at high school with your friends. I was always just. I felt like I was just an insecure boy that wanted to look, wanted to be cool, and wasn't. That's yeah. what I thought. No, I definitely see those people in high school, and I that think was of you. Yeah. Really? <laughs> edit that out. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, it's really cool to be able to experience this with them. In so doing, he was able to help his older brother turn his life around and be a father to his son. For him to be out here sober with his son, you know, I know I gave him that opportunity because of a lot of addiction, it's and a big part of that is changing your environment. In Montana, it's a hellhole, it can suck you in. So to give him the opportunity to be able to come out here and work is, uh, it's been awesome. What can you really say about that? It brings some nice symmetry to the story. Sean had once watched his own father go the extra mile to support people trying to rebuild shattered lives. And now through his success, that's exactly what Sean has been able to do for his own brother. And that's another huge win 
for the O'Malley family. 